My friends, and welcome back to the Rendezvous here on deck number four. I'm glad to have you back with us. My name is Jason. I'm your cruise host, and today I'm very excited to have a special guest. Uh, before we jump into it, by all means, please come back and join us. We have a couple more of these over the next two days. I don't want you to miss them. We have two more wonderful uh, groups of people and an individual. One more group and an individual I'm going to have on stage tomorrow. I have Grand Funk Railroad uh, here in the room. Yeah. And then at the end of the week, I'm going to bring back our, uh, our beloved Mr. Mickey Dolans back here to the stage. So come back and join me for All Access Pass the next two days. That certainly doesn't, uh, I, I, when I say that, I just want to get it out of the way because I certainly don't want to take anything away from the man I'm about to welcome to the stage. Uh, you know him, of course, as Paul Revere and the Raiders. You know him, you love him, and you've loved him for a long, long time. One of the original teen and idols. Do me a favor. Please welcome out the one and only Mr. Mark Lindsay. Hello, sports fans. <laughs> Jason. Thanks for being here, sir. I'm good to be here, Jason. We're glad, glad to, to have you. We're very, very glad to have you. Uh, what would you get into today? Did you go out and cause some trouble? Or? Oh, of course. Uh, uh, they, didn't you see the security bring me on stage? I did. Me back to the ship? You're a big deal. You're a big I, uh, deal. In an ambulance? <laughs> in an ambulance. <laughs> That's the amount of fun that was had. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what's it like being back on the Flower Power Cruise, first and foremost? It's great. Star Vista does such a great job every year, and, and we're glad to be. I mean, like, I, I can't imagine being, uh, not being, you know, an artist and being one of the guests. And how do you get everything done in one day? There's so much stuff to do. There's so much, yeah. yeah. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, and I've said this before in this show, it's very cool because this is one of the few cruises we do where the artists are fans of each other. Uh, I, I see you guys all hanging out. You're seeing each other's shows. It, there's a cool camaraderie there. Yeah, well, you know, we we grew up listening to each other's records and, and wanting to, hey, I gotta get a better one than that next time. And it was it was like, like uh, Friendly camaraderie, and and we respect everybody, and, and that's still alive doing this, you know. No small feat. Uh, it's an accomplishment. I I'm not making this up. I I talked to someone yesterday, and you'll appreciate this. I was talking to someone yesterday who was confused that it wasn't the real Jimi Hendrix in, in the. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I'm well, very serious. No, not as dead as he. Yeah, no, I'm not as dead as that. <laughs> But they were no. they were like, wait a minute. So it's not Jimmy? I was like, no, it's not. Where have you been for 50 years? Uh, so it's yes. Jimmy would Jimmy's spirit would be, would laugh at that. I promise you. I I I, I can I can only imagine. Uh, well, welcome back. As I said, and we're very glad to have you. Fifty summers of love is what we're calling the show. It's you and Mickey. Tell us a little bit about uh, the show. Uh, last year, early in the year, Mickey calls me and says, "Look, I got this great idea." And Mickey and I have done a couple of shows together, and and usually it's uh, you know one goes on and does a show, then the other guy goes on. But we did a thing uh, way back when with uh, Peter Noon for a while, the three of us, and it was kind of like Ben Bamboo. It was kind of like the Rat Pack on stage. So Mickey said, let's do something like we did Ben. So the two of us are on stage, both together, all the time. And uh, I sing some of his songs. He sings some of my songs. We sing some songs together. We insult each other. We get in a couple of <laughs> couple of fist fights, you know. It's good, no, clean entertainment. Good, yeah, clean no, it's, entertainment. It's just, it's, it's just a lot of fun. And... I think the fans get to see a different side of us because they get to see a little bit more personality than just the, hi, how you doing, babe, uh, you know? Well, I, I think it's very cool. It's, it's very unique when you get to see stars share the stage. And again, I go back to the camaraderie thing that we were talking about a moment ago. There's a lot of stars that won't share a stage. It, uh, maybe you'll a do a split <laughs> bill. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe they'll do a split bill, but they won't share a stage. So uh, w when he calls you and says, do you want to do this, I, I assume you... Absolutely. Well, we, we, we work well together. We, we kind of have the same sense of humor. We're, we're both Pisces. We're both kind of like junior scientists. And uh, it, you know, it, it works. It works. We have a lot of the same interests. And uh, are, you, are you doing this show anywhere other than the ship? Uh, we did all summer, off and on. We were around the States. Uh, so if you saw us, uh, <laughs> great. If you didn't, this is the last, this is the, the last culmination yeah. of the 50 Summers of Love. And and not only is it, you know, the uh, we get all the Mickey and Mark stuff out, the Raiders and the Monkeys, and that's a lot, a big slice of uh, 
of the pie there. But the uh, the Fab Four, they do. I mean, you know, the Beatles were they had a, a lot of responsibility for some of the great songs. Sure. <laughs> and the Fab Four does a great job of that. So uh, it's just a great show. We have fun. And this is the last one. This is the culmination of the entire tour. This is it, babe. Unless unless there's uh, a re-erection somewhere. Oh, re-erection. A re-erection? <laughs> hey, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the summer of love, my friends. It's it the is. summer of love. Of course. <laughs> it could resurrect, but it's, it's I like more the, fun I, if it re-erects. I like it better my way. <laughs> yeah. It's, I'm sure you're not the only one. Uh <laughs> <laughs> That's so, why they sell those little blue pills. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have them in the Ocean View Cafe just for that reason. We actually just inject them right into the uh. nectarines. They're called erectorines up there. I'm sure they Woo. get them up there. Moving on quickly to the next uh, to the next step. My glasses are getting steamy. Yeah. <laughs> see Alice. We'll see everybody. Uh, wait, this could go on a long time. Sorry. Stop. I apologize. Stop. <laughs> Uh, I apologize. Uh, so that we're talking about today, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about yesterday. And by yesterday, I'm talking about Paul Revere and the Raiders getting sure. going. Uh, how does it come to be? How does it become to be known as Paul Revere and the Raiders? Uh, in 1958, when I was like 15, 16, I was in Caldwell, Idaho, and uh, I had a friend who was in a band. But right across the street, there was a guy that had a restaurant. Well, this is getting along. Anyway, make it my long story short. There was a band called Red Hughes and the, just the Red Hughes band. He was a kid in high school and he was the lead singer. And he had two guitar players in the band. Uh, and they auditioned the guy that had the restaurant as a piano player. And that was Revere. So he, he got in the that band. That was Paul Revere. Yeah. Well, well, his name then was Revere Dick. Re uh, well. No, uh, Here um, we go. Back to the. No. Uh, no. And I, I won't say that he dropped his. Uh, no. Don't yeah. Uh, he, Sometimes he, you gotta. So I'm well, moving ahead here. So we we became uh, so it was Red Hughes band and I used to set in because I was uh, a roommate of one of the guitar players. So I kept showing up at the, at the dances and uh, pretty soon I had kind of a following. So it was prom night and Red Hughes said to the band, "Whatever you do, don't let Lindsay on stage till I get till I get here." So it's like you know. Going on toward the intermission, everybody says, "Why don't you get up and sing?" I said, "Well, you know, it's uh, uh, I'm not feeling like it." Finally, I said, "Screw it!" You know, I just jumped on stage and, went, and was rocking and rolling. I was wailing when Red came through the door, and he went, ah, "Yeah!" He runs up, he says, "Get off the frickin' stage!" He did not say frickin'. I didn't think he said frickin'. No. And so then, after the show was over, he took the band around behind. This is the IWF Hall in Kewan, Idaho. Took the band around behind the ba the the building and said, "Look, if you ever let Lindsay on stage again, you're all fired." So I w I went home that day that that evening. I thought, "Man, it's all over. That's it. That's the end of my career." And uh, so I'm I'm in the depths, the the extreme depths of despair. And Revere calls me about you know like uh, this was on a Friday night. On Sunday he calls me. He says, "Look," he said, "I thought about it. The band thought about it. We took a vote." We all quit Red Hughes and wanted to hire you as the lead singer. <laughs> so, so very cool. I used to show up and rehearse because I was I was the only guy that was well, you know, I was 15 years old. <laughs> I didn't have a life except music. I mean, even though I was working in a bakery, that was a part-time job. So, uh, Paul and I became kind of partners, and and the band then became the Downbeats. And and finally, named uh, after a magazine, is that correct? Is that's that? I, I look. I was taking a sax. I took two sax lessons in my life, and I walk into the to the the, the tenor player's uh, house. And he's got a copy of Downbeat magazine. I thought, man, Downbeat, that's a cool name for a band. <laughs> Not knowing that probably was a million bands called there. There's, there's another Downbeat yeah. out there. Anyway, so we the band quit, stopped for a couple of years while Revere had to go into the service. And then we reformed in Portland, Oregon. We walk and we wear red La Jolla blazers, you know, colorless blazers. Your your town, Portland. Portland, Oregon, baby. And we're walking up Sandy Boulevard to get pick up a cleaning, and we walk past this costume shop. And here in the costume shop are all these, uh, you know, period pieces with George Washington costumes. I said, to Revere, look, that's the way Paul Revere and the Raiders. Do. Oh, how did he get to be Paul Revere and the Raiders? Uh, <laughs> that's a question you ask me. It is. I think that was yesterday, though. So I. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, Paul goes to the service. You're the uh, downbeats. We're the, we're the downbeats. We come back. We're... Uh, thank you. Thank you. So we, we make our first record in... <laughs> hey, look, it's been a long time since yeah. Guardian America. We make our first record in 1960, 1960. And the name of the group is the Downbeats. So we, we're signing our contracts in, in, in California with this down, Gardena Records. And it says, full, subside, write your full name and your age and so on and so forth. So uh, he looks down, Mark Lindsay, da 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 He says, down, and then the name of the group, Downbeats. And he looks at Revere and says, Revere Dick, Revere, and full name, Paul Revere Dick. Paul Revere Dick, wait a minute, Paul Revere, he's real famous. That will be a great, better name than the Downbeats. And Revere, at the time, he was so paranoid of being called Paul Revere because when he was a kid in school, people said, sure. Paul Revere, where's your horse? Yeah, yeah, of course. So that's why he dropped his first name and became Revere, uh, Revere Dick. Anyway, John Gus says... Uh, you can't write this stuff, folks. No. This is <laughs> no, no, you can't, not at this age. Uh <laughs> So John says, uh, Revere says, no, 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 it's, it's not, don't use the name Paul Revere. He hated it. It was, like, it was like, you know, there was no leader in the band, really. I mean, Paul and I were the kind of partners, and, and I was doing most of the music. But it was just like, you know, everybody got the same pay, and pretty much, <laughs> $5. That's what he said it was, anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's anyway, so uh, the record comes out, and here on it is Paul Revere and the Night Riders. And we hit the, we hit the fan, and uh, we hit the, we hit. Hit the fan, and ship. we call ship like cruise ship. The ship, the ship, hit, hit, the the ship hit the fan. So we call back, and John Guest says, "Well, okay, I'll, I'll change it to something else, but it's got to be a Paul Revere and something." So I'm, I'm laying in bed that night, think Paul Revere and the Night Riders. That sounds like cowboys, and I had just seen a poster for the Raiders, uh, you know, the, the football you know, yeah. team, football team in Oakland. I thought Raiders, yeah, that's a great name. So I said, "How about Paul Revere and the Raiders?" So we. Called him, and that's how it became. But that's how they changed the name, and it became Paul Revere and the Raiders. But that's a hell of a long answer that's for a short question. Listen. Do you have one more question, and we'll be through? That's our entire first 10-minute segment right there. Uh, don't go anywhere, my friends. Don't change the channel. Back with more with Mark Lindsay in just a moment. More lies. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks for not leaving or turning the channel. I'm here with Mr. Mark Lindsay. We were just discussing <laughs> Paul Revere and the Raiders. And now I'm going to transition you into the costumes because that's okay. where you were going. How did you decide to take it to that next level? Okay. We're walking up the street, as I said, to pick Sandy up Sandy Boulevard. Sandy Boulevard, Portland, Oregon. Walking up the street to get our costumes, uh, our, our La Jolla blazers, which we pick, pick up. And here's the period costumes in the window. So I said to Revere, look. Now, that's the way Paul Revere, you know, and the, and the guys used to dress back in the day. And we looked at each other and went, yeah. So we went in and rented them for one night. We were playing at the, if anybody was there, we were playing at the, uh, at the uh, Lake Oswego Armory that night. So the first part of the show, we went on with our, our colorless blazers. And we did, you know, first half of the show. Intermission, we changed into the Raider outfits, came back, and... It was like we had dressed up for the circus. I look over and hear the hear the the bass players wearing a lace dicky, and you know, here we are again. Hey, the bass. Ah, never mind the bass player. <laughs> yeah, never mind. But it, it, the whole tenor of the show changed. I mean, it was like I felt I was in costume, which I was. So we had a water fight. We just, you know, I got down on the floor and rolled around and. And that, that was the beginning of a lot of the antics right there. But I, I felt there's in, I couldn't do, I could do anything I wanted and no one would care. No one would know it was me. <laughs> and so it went over very well. We came back to the Portland. We went to Hawaii, came back after that to Portland and did a show. And everybody said, where's your costumes? So Paul and I look at each other again and say, oh, okay. So we had some made and they became uh, our trademark more or less. And I think we're all grateful for it. And uh, it's about that time you, you start to grow the hair out. You really embrace it. You know, yeah, yeah. You get the Finally, I, for, this, for this tour, here we are again. Here we are again. Uh, so where does Dick Clark come into this? Okay, we, uh, we're in Portland. See the how King he did that? Brought it right back Back around. to Portland, Oregon. The Kingsmen are a rock and roll band in high school. And we are rock and rollers a little bit older. But, and it was, there was friendly competition. And everybody, everybody, you know, said it was like cutthroat. Um, between the two bands. It wasn't, 
I got my first copy of Louie Louie from Mike, Mike, uh, the guitar player in the Kingsman. Anyway, people were requesting the song called Louie Louie, and we'd never heard it. And I asked Mike, I said, what's, what's a Louie Louie? And he said, do you guys don't know Louie Louie? And so he brought down his copy, and we got it out. We learned it. We found out. We played it, and everybody danced. And we had to play it like three times a night. So finally, after about one summer of that, you know, we, we get the bright idea, wait a minute, maybe we should cut, we'd cut another a record before, maybe we should cut this, because it seems very popular with the teens. So at the same time, Dick, uh, Ken Chase, who was the Kingsman's manager, got the same idea. So we go into the uh, Northwest Recorders, Bob, somebody was the engineer, I can't remember now, doesn't matter, but the same engineer, the same microphone, the same, everything the same, the same week. And uh, if you ask who cut it first, if you, if you had asked Paul uh, before, he would have said the week, the week cut it first. But my memory is, I'm packing up my sax because I did night train for the flip side. Packing up the sax in the studio, in the control room, and Bob says, you know, if I were you guys, I'd get this out right away. And I said, why? He says, because the Kingsman were in here and cut a demo of this two days ago. Well, what he thought was the demo was the Kingsman's final version. And uh, make a long story a little shorter, uh, Columbia Records, the, the rep, the, the rep was in, in the radio station, and Roger Hart was our kind of manager, mm -hmm. who was a DJ at Kissin' there. And he said, what's this? And there's a whole stack of, of our Louis Louis. And he says, well, that's my band. Have, have a copy. So he took it to CBS. And CBS was under big pressure to sign a rock and roll band. Now, Mitch Miller was the head of a and He ain't going to sign no rock and roll bands, believe me. He hated rock and roll. He thought it was a passing fad. He thought, if I hold out just a couple years... Yeah. Uh, this rock and roll thing is going to die. Yeah, yeah. It'll, be, it'll be Mitch Miller and, the, and, and his Mitch Miller singers. So anyway... Very creative. But they signed, they signed us, and... You were the first rock group signed, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. To, to CBS Records. So the, both records come out simultaneously. The Kingsman sold 600 copies in Portland. We sold 6,000 in, in a week. So we're off and running, we, and we have the whole West Coast up and down, all the way down to San, to San Jose, and we're breaking into Portland. To breaking into Portland. Portland, Oregon. Sorry, yeah. I'm already going in, too. We're breaking into L.A., and the, uh, the guys at Scepter Wand are, are desperate to try to get the Kingsman's record happening. So they go to K KHJ, or no, KGFJ, KGFJ, which was the black station in L.A., and they go and say, man, you know, it's really, it's really a shame. We got this group called the Kingsmen, which they didn't say they weren't yeah. black, yeah. group called the Kingsmen, and it's really a shame how those, those, those uh, I'm, I'll, just, I'll just be right with you, white boys, you know, uh, at CBS are just peeing all over us. And so K KGFJ jumped on the record, and then it kind of oozed into a couple of other stations because it was an R&B. And they, and at the same time, Mitch Miller said, because we were breaking the, into L.A., Mitch Miller said, kill that record. He said, do not promote this record in L.A. I, I, you know, I'll tr fire everybody if it comes to L.A. So it stopped right there, and we thought, well, that was the end of the record. Then uh, there was a little hiatus, and a guy named... Arnie Woo Woo Ginsburg. Oh, Woo Woo. In, in Boston, it's about six months, three months, four, three, three or four months later, said, Kids, I've got the worst song you've ever <laughs> heard. <laughs> Stay tuned after this break. I want to play the lousiest, worst song you've ever heard. Played Louie Louie. And of course, the phones lit up, and the rest, as they say, is rock and roll history. That's so, pretty cool. <laughs> but as I like to say, the Kingsman got the hit. We we had the career, and everybody lived happily ever after. Yeah, yeah. And what everyone in the room would like to know is, where did Dick Clark come into all of this, okay. which was the original question. Well, you got to <laughs> so work with oh, me Mark, here, I Jason. Love I love with you, me. brother. I love you. I'm just okay. That's why I was leading you back in. So, we're, so where now, the action is, right? So where the action? Well, no, it's before that. Oh, before so that. now, so now, our our manager makes a deal with the manager of uh, the the I, the the Isley Brothers, the so Everly. Uh, no, no, no. Help so me here. The, some of the brothers. The uh, Bill Medley and oh, Righteous Brothers. Righteous Brothers. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, he doesn't remember Righteous, but he remembers Bill Medley. That's good. I, I'll take it. Well, he, he still, I just had Bill. There you go. So she, we traded some dates. She said, look, I'll get you some dates in L.A. if you give me some dates in Oregon. So we went down, and we played the first show that the Rolling Stones played in the States at the L Long, Long, Long Beach Long Arena. Beach Arena. I feel like it's an interactive interview at this point. This is good. Yes, thank this you. This is good. Thank, he's a plant. He he's, was there. He, he's a plant. He was there. Uh, there were 17 groups. Uh, one of the groups was uh, Caesar and Cleo. And Caesar and Cleo came out and did a couple songs, and she had a breakaway skirt, ripped off her skirt, and was in a little mini skirt. They, of course, became Sonny and Cher. Sonny and Cher. But they were one of the groups. We had, we were there. We did like three songs. I danced on the piano and just so happened that our manager was seated next to one of the secretaries at the work at Dick Clark. So she goes back to her boss and says, hey, you know that new show that you're doing a pilot for? Well, I just saw these crazy guys from Idaho. They're going to work, or from Oregon. <laughs> we were uh, back in Idaho then. They're going to work cheap because they're from the Northwest. <laughs> they're, we all do. We they're, all work And cheap Dick Clark Oregon. liked that. And they're very, they're very active. They're, very, you know, they're insane. So he signed us for the pilot. And it was with uh, Jan and Dean and uh, the Shirelles and a whole bunch of people in the pilot. CBS didn't like the pilot, but ABC picked it up. So Dick Clark signed us for 13 weeks. And he, and he told us later, he said, look, we, had a, we were in a bar one day. And he said, you know, I signed you for 13 weeks because I thought if this show takes off, after 13 weeks, I'll be able to afford a real band for that. <laughs> And, of, you know, it was like kind of like a precursor to MTV. Like I said the other day, the whole nation got to see us at once. They yeah. liked what they saw, thank God. And uh, we became the house band. The house band for, for Dick Clark. There's worse things. And it was, it, I, I got to say, talk about camaraderie and working with Please. various artists. On that show, we got to see everybody that had a, a record on the charts for about three years. In fact, everybody with the Beatles and the Stones were there in person. The Who was there. Uh, Peter New was there. Every, everybody, you know, and all the American artists, all the R&B artists, everybody from James Brown to uh, Aretha. I think Aretha was on the show. Maybe not. Just say yes. They don't know. She was there. <laughs> Aretha I was there. I, at least I remember her. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, it was, it was just great to be able to see everybody that was your, your idols and that you'd grown sure. up listening to. You know, they were all playing there in front of you. It was like amazing. That sounds like it would be a dream come true, especially for, yeah, for, for a band kids. as they're breaking in. Yeah, yeah, a band from Idaho, man, come on. <laughs> all right, we've got another segment. Don't go anywhere, my friends. Back with Mr. Mark Lindsay in just a moment. It goes so fast. <laughs> Showtime. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. We are here with uh, Mark Lindsay, and we are talking about Everything, seemingly. Everything that you don't want to know. <laughs> we're, covering, we're covering every step of the way from Sandy Boulevard in Portland, Oregon, to Idaho, down to L.A. And uh, at what point, and I've asked this of, of all the other uh, artists uh, that I've had up here, at what point did you know you guys had made it? What point did it click that, wow, this is really going to work? Okay, I thought about that. And the other day, I said that it was when we were on the Ed Sullivan show, I knew we'd made it because yep. we grew up watching Ed Sullivan. But there were two places. There were two big, big... Uh, events, I think. The other one was we were in Ohio, and the show had been on for about a year, and we're opening up for the Rolling Stones, right? And we get there, and the guy says, okay, you're closing. Well, no, wait a minute. No, we can't close for the Stones. And he said, no, you're, you're bigger than the Stones in this town, you know, because of the TV, because of the TV show. So I said, well, you tell him. <laughs> So he went to, 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 uh, to Mick and uh, told him, and I remember we were on stage, we're going on stage, and the stage, just, just as the curtains are opening, and I see Mick in the wings, and he's going, who the f*** are these guys? <laughs> so at that point, I thought, man, I guess we have made it, you know? And then they broke every instrument on the way out. Yeah, and, <laughs> and because of that, I think Mick always had this thing in his craw, and years later, when they were going to be signed to, was it Warner's? Uh, they were holding out. And so Lenny calls him up and says, you know, look, we've only got a place for one more group. I'm going to sign Paul Over and the Raiders if it, 
And he said, no, we'll Sign take us now. it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Those bums aren't closing for us again. Yeah. Well, one of the things I like to do in this show, if you'd be so kind, is I, I do like to open up to the audience to ask a few questions. And so the audience has asked a few questions. And uh, I asked Mark before, I said, is there any place you don't want to go? He said, absolutely not. He said, if they wrote it down, we can chat about it. So uh, Deb, all the way from Palm Beach, Florida, said, what is Phil Volk doing now? Phil Volk is living in Vegas. Uh, talked to him uh, a few months ago. Uh, he's living in Vegas. He plays with his family band uh, around various places. And we almost did a show together, but he sprained his back and couldn't do it. So I'm not sure we'll, we'll ever play together or not. But we had a good time when we did. Well, thank you. Yeah. Dee Dee. Dee Dee is all the way from Riverside, California. Is Dick with her. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Dick and Dee Dee. Uh, says, what did you do with your ponytail when you very first cut it off? Uh, well, part of it went uh, in a contest with Dick Clark, which he said, probably sent about four hairs to this girl who... who, who uh, they had this contest, uh, trade something or do something with Mark Lindsay's ponytail. She traded an iguana for it. Time out. The, that's the, the weirdest the, thing. That's the, the weirdest the, sentence the, I've the ever heard. The iguana actually showed up at Dick Clark's office, and they, they wanted to give it to me. I said, no, <laughs> I don't know what to do with this thing. So I but guess you can still have four hairs. There you go. Yeah. But, but the, uh, the rest of it went on the barber's floor. And then uh, I thought about growing it, and then I didn't. And then uh, last time we were on Happy Together, we got, you know, people said, well, why, you know, what about the ponytail? Why don't you bring it back? I thought, well... So when I found out I was on that and then this, I thought, why not? I'll give it one more try. <laughs> it's the fact, you can still do it. That's not, the not as thick as it used to be, but <laughs> it's there. There's a lot of folks just hoping for hair. So the fact <laughs> that you can grow a ponytail, God bless you. I'll, I'll save this for somebody when I cut yeah, it off. Yeah, well, just if you have an iguana, bring it on the next. And uh, Dee Dee's follow-up question, she said, we love you. When are you coming back to the Hollywood show in L.A.? The Holly Hollywood show. Yeah. What's the Hollywood show? You mean? Four years ago. You mean at Beverly Hills Theater? Well, ah. This year with Happy Together. The autograph show. Oh, oh, that show. one. The that autograph one. show. I have no idea. Talk to my manager. I don't have one, but there you go. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. If, if they call and ask and it fits in the schedule, I'll be there. I'd love to be there. Jenny and Steve, all the way from Dallas. Hey, Jenny and Steve, where are you? They're just to your right, just to your right hey, over there. Hey, how you doing, guys? They have a very personal question. How much? Don't do don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> how much do you like Texas Bloody Marys? Uh, enough that I had my <laughs> pants half off when we left. <laughs> <laughs> That'll answer your question. Yeah, everyone's <laughs> like, "What does that even mean?" How does one uh, trade? Well, I went, we went out. We we went to see these guys in Texas one time. We went out in the had Bloody Marys. And they started about eight in the morning, I think it was. <laughs> this they said they got the best Bloody Marys in Texas, and they did. <laughs> Thurston joins us. Thurston's had a few questions in here. I like Thurston. He joins us from La Mirada, California, home of Mr. Music. He Mr. said. Uh, he said Mark knows what that means. I, I Do you own a nightclub? <laughs> No, I do not. Somewhere in the United States. And if so, do you ever find time to visit it with your hectic schedule? But I know you don't, if you don't own a nightclub, you can unless also... Unless I, 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 might, I might have forgotten, but as far... <laughs> <laughs> unless, uh, unless I'm uh, living under... Uh, uh, well, you had a restaurant in Portland for a while, didn't you? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I worked at a radio station there. Yeah. I became a DJ, which is my dream when I was a kid for about three years. Got to be number one in my slot. So when you were a kid, your dream was radio DJ. When I was a kid, I used to listen to the radio and hear the guys. And, and I loved to sing, but I looked in the mirror and saw this skinny, geeky kid. I thought, no, nah, <laughs> this isn't going to happen for me. But I can get behind the mic. Because I'd seen a couple of DJs, and some of them weren't the most handsome guys in thought the world. thought you had a face for radio. A face for radio. Yeah. So I thought, well, I, c I could maybe do this. So I always wanted to do that. But then, of course, when the music thing came along and I got drafted to be a lead singer, I thought, well, maybe I'll put the DJ thing off for a while. But finally got to do it. So with that, with that being said, and so you're thinking to yourself, ah, I don't know if this kid's going to make it, and you, you, you want to be a radio DJ. When you become a true teen idol, 
But that that's got to kind of play with your head a little bit. Uh, it was not real. It was like there always have been, and there still is. There's two Mark Lindsays, and there's the the I hate to you know hate to be split personality like that. But when I saw the the uh, the articles in the teen magazines, that sure. was like another guy. It was like no, it's not really me because you know I knew the really me is really this geeky guy, <laughs> and I, I just could, I thought well that's nice that they're doing this, but it was just it was really hard for me to accept it and it still is. I mean it's like I really appreciate it that all you people are here, uh, but uh, you know thanks for hanging with me. That, that's a very personal moment. That's a very personal moment, I, and I think everyone here appreciates you sharing that because there is there there has to be a. You mentioned that when you were in character, when you were in costume, you felt like you could do anything, right? Absolutely. And that's kind of that second personality, almost that stage persona that takes over, and where you become Paul Revere in the Raiders, where you become Ex Mark Lindsay. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I I, I joke with uh, the guys in the band and stuff as well after rehearsal. Well, I gotta go back. It's gonna take me an hour or two to turn into Mark Lindsay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but part of, part of it is is like it's a mindset, you know. You gotta sure kind of get there, and then you're there. Uh, but when then when the lights come on, that's you know, and the curtain come goes up, that's when you know it's like a flash bulb, and then you're there. Sure. Uh, Cindy and Robin, all the way from Illinois, say, and this is actually, what has been the best highlight of your career? The best highlight of my career. Or one of, one of, <laughs> when you think personally, personally. Woo! Uh, Here we are. <laughs> marrying my wife. Thank you. Yes, marrying my wife. That's the. <laughs> it, professionally, we'll say professionally, uh, okay. so we don't get him okay. in trouble here. Obviously. Okay. Uh, probably. Believe it or not, signing our first record, hearing hearing our first record, on the radio the very first time, and it was like. A uh, stupid single that I played tambourine on, didn't even sing on. Uh, but hearing that and knowing I was there, and, and I did sing another song that wasn't on that record, but I knew I'd done it, you know. It was like, yeah, we're on the radio, and, and everybody I'd heard on the radio was a star. So sure. all of a sudden, it was like, I was there, you know. That's very cool. Uh, and we, we have one more question, which I'll get to in one second. And before we go, and I know, again, frustration, two nights in a row. Uh, I'm going to give you a little, a little secret. We're going to give you a little secret about something that's going on tonight. We've got to get Mark out of here because Mark has a little bit of a rehearsal. Now, obviously, you know he's not playing tonight, but that obviously means he's playing tonight. So if you feel like swinging by, let's say, around 1130 for Peter Asher's acoustic set. If you feel like swinging by, you might just see somebody. Matter of fact, you might see a couple people you know real well, and one of them might be on stage and not be me. So uh, we do have to get him out here. I apologize for autograph hunters out there. But he did sign the other day, and you've got another Q&A coming up with Mickey in a couple of days on Friday. You and Mickey have another Q&A. If I do, uh, tell me about it. Great. Yeah, uh, okay. and I'm sure I'll be, I'll be there. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure they'll be generous enough to sign a bit for you there as well. So uh, forgive us. I know we have one more question over on the side. Yeah, please fire away. I know you're off camera, but. Yo. Please tell me why you're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, but if if they don't want us, well, you know, sorry. Well, uh, you know, it, I don't I don't know how it works. I don't know who who votes for that. Uh, Apparently, idiots. I I I, I heard I heard, that I heard just uh, you know uh, just uh, on the side that it's very political. I I have no doubt and, that it's very. And political. I do know this. Uh, there was uh, a, a guy that was the head of the Rock and Roll for Hall, of Hall of Fame who I think still may be there, and he said, there are three groups that are never going to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Parvin the Raiders, Chicago, and the Monkees. The Monkees. So are the Monkees in yet? No. no. Chicago I know Chicago is, Chicago so hey, maybe there's a shot. <laughs> 
Like I said, he's taking time out of his day to come down here and chat with us. And uh, he's also going to run out of here right now, like I said, and do a little rehearsal for something you may get to see him in. Tonight, 1130 upstairs in the Revelations is Peter Asher's acoustic set. And like I said, he's got a couple of famous friends swinging by. So I hope you'll come by and see us. Do me a favor. Please help me thank the one and only Mr. Mark Lindsay. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming up, everybody. Thank you, Jason. Have a great day. Thanks, Mark. Right, Have a great day, my friends. Bye-bye. See you out and about.